hopefully. Um, am I able to share, Kirk? Uh, yep, you should be able to know. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, uh, as John mentioned, um, I'll be presenting about my exchanger to Italy. Uh, my name is Sam. I have been a member of this club for almost a year and I was an outbound to Italy 2011-2012. So after graduating from high school, I decided to do a gap year with Rotary Youth Exchange. And Rotary is something that's very familiar to me. My mom was an exchange student. Um, Stephanie is uh, on the call today. She was an exchange student, student to Brazil. Um, Chrisanne, my aunt, was an exchange student to Brazil as well. And then my cousin, Eleanor, who's also on the call. Um, and so I've been very familiar with the Rotary Exchange program. And I was very excited when I got to get to go to Italy. So the town where I lived in Italy was called Cremona. And before learning about Cremona, I had never heard of it. And uh, I, there were two other exchange students who were going to Italy uh, with me. One went to Sardinia, the other was in Lake Como. And Cremona, it was a, it's a very provincial town. It's about 72,000 people and it's known for its violin shops. And I'll talk to that in a few other slides. But when I went abroad, I started a blog and that's what you have right here, uh, Country Swap, a Rotary Exchange student's journey from Minnesota to Italy. And when I was going through pictures and finding out what to put in these slides, I read through the first four months of my exchange. And so if you're interested in reading about uh, my first four months, you're more than welcome to check out my blog. Um, there's not much written in there, but it documents the, fir uh, the first four months. That's great, Sam. If you get a chance to throw the blog link into chat during the presentation today sometime, that'd be great. I'd love to take a look. Absolutely, I certainly will. Um, so as I mentioned before, Cremona is this, I call the city of violins. Um, there's over 140 violin shops and the Cremona is famous for the Stradivarius violin made by Antonio Stradivari, whose home is still in Cremona. And recently, a couple of years ago, Cremona built this museum dedicated to violin making. And so in the center, you see uh, the hall of violins. And these are violins dating all the way back to around 1400s made by various um, violin makers, including Stradivari. And the detail about on some of these, such as the head on the violin and then the old lute um, as well in the case. And I learned that they still play these violins because they need to keep the violin uh, limbered up and um, the sound is absolutely spectacular. When I was, um, I think it was in around November time, they always have, a, they call it Festa del Violino, um, fest, a violin festival where they celebrate um, Antonio Stradivari and making of the violins. And with the um, exchange students, we got to hear one of the, these violins being played along with also getting a tour of one of the violin shops. And every violin is made by hand. And it's really interesting because the wood that's made, uh, the violin that's made from the wood, it's a certain, it has to come from a certain tree and a certain temperature for the sound to be just right. And it takes months to make these violins and they continue, they still make these violins the way that Antonio Stradivari made them hundreds of years ago. The photo on the right, that is a photo from 2018. I went back with my parents to Italy um, right after graduating from college and that is uh, in a violin shop we went to. Um, the two violin makers are friends of my host, of my third host family. 
And those are some of the violins that they made. And as you can see on the wall, they have multiple different forms of violins from very small to very large. Um, si some violin makers make uh, cellos and basses as well. Some of the sights and sounds of Cremona. Um, so Cremona is uh, the, the, the town center, the, I'd call this the town center area. Uh, it has a terrazzo, which is the bell tower on the left. Uh, the terrazzo is over 300 feet tall and it was built around the 14th century. And it is the tallest structure in Europe built by bricks. And I think they're over, I think they're just over 300 steps to the very top and it provides panoramic views of the entire countryside of Cremona. The horoscope clock in the middle, that is, that is also uh, 14th century years old and it still works. And then the cathedral, uh, which is attached to the terrazzo is a Romanesque 12th century cathedral. And then to the very right, it's hard to see, but that's the baptistry, an octagonal baptistry. But inside the cathedral is absolutely gorgeous. It's all painted, um, murals everywhere. Um, there is also a crypt underneath. And remember during um, Easter season, there was, it was very busy in my town. There was a processional that um, I walked through with the town with my host mom. And then um, on Easter Sunday, they had a church service here. Some more sights and sounds. Um, on my exchange year, it was very common for students to, and people, uh, to go out Saturday nights because that was like their Friday. School was always Monday through Saturday for about five hours a day. And we'd come home after school and my host moms and all my host families, they'd come home, we'd have a little lunch and then they'd go back to work. And so the piazza in the upper left, that was the main piazza where I got to meet up with my friends. And a uh, little funny story, on my first weekend in Cremona, I met some friends of my host brother and uh, they said, oh, we're gonna be in the piazza, come at around nine. So I said, okay, perfect. So had dinner, I got ready, I was ready to go 9 p.m. I leave the house and I get to this piazza and no one is there. It is silent. And so I come back to, I go back to my host family's house and they're like, why are you back? And I said, no one's out yet. And so then I finally got into the swing of things that um, the event, uh, evenings events don't really happen until about 10. 10 o'clock p.m. Um, but at that time, this plate, this the piazza would be sprawling with people. Um, right in the middle are my two host brothers from my third host family, and it was very it's very common for people to meet up for an aperitivo, um, which is like an appetite, like a pre, like a happy hour almost. Um, and so that was very common to do um, during the day. Um, also getting coffees and um, enjoying the weather outside when it was nice. And then also the gelaterias, um, getting ice cream there was very popular. The photo on the right is actually one of my favorite streets in Cremona. And all the streets in Cremona are very similar to this. Um, they're very narrow. Um, they're all cobblestone. You have people on bicycles, people walking. Um, and just very cute shops and bakeries. Um, the shop on the lower left, Lanfranchi, that's a very um, typical bakery um, from Cremona. A lot of traditional dishes like Torone, which is, um, which is actually the town's um, signature dessert. It's like a nougat, uh, nougat with almond. And they also, um, during the year, there's a call, uh, something called the Festa del Torone, where it's like the violin festival, but instead they're celebrating Torone and this, this dessert of, of the town. 
and there's music and dancing and there's vendors all over the square for this and the, the city really comes to life. Some activities and daily life of my time in Italy. Um, I attended Liceo Scientifico and there were a couple other high schools. This was the Liceo Scientifico was more of the science high school. There was a lot of math, physics, and other science courses. And after I completed high school, I, had, I hadn't completed all the way up through calculus. And so I actually got a glimpse of calculus in this school. And um, uh, like I said, I went to school five days a week. Um, I had a class of about 18, 18 to 20 students. And I remember the first day of school getting to class and it was it's like one of those moments that the new student walks in the door opens to the classroom and everyone turns around to see who's at the door so that was me um it was i still remember that and the only spot available was in the front very center which was great too because then i got to stay engaged with uh, my professors i also got the opportunity to teach some english um, to my class and to other classrooms um, within the school. Um, I taught English at one of the other high schools in town. And um, that was really fun just to experience, um, just to help others uh, experience the English language and help them with their uh, language skills. Um, the photo in the lower center, that is the theater um, in town. It's over 270 years old. Uh, it's named after Amilcare Pankeli. If you're familiar with um, the movie Fantasia, there's a song called Dance of the Hours, and he is the composer of that song, and this is the theater that's named after him. Uh, my first time in this theater, I went with my host dad to see Rigoletto, and if some of you are familiar with that, there's a, there's a tune in there, um, La Donna e Mobile. It's a very popular Italian song. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a very neat experience. It was my first time um, in a setting like that to see a live performance in a different language. Um, I still remember at the, top of the, at the top of the platform of the stage, they had a screen with the words written out in Italian. So I could, I sort of read, <laughs> read the words going across the street in, in the uh, little Italian that I knew at the time. And then after school, um, I would, I was part of the rowing team actually in my town. And I would go to the Canottieri Baldesio. And here I would work out with the team Two, uh, two hours a day for six days a week. And that was the entire year. And it was a really great way for me to meet other people in the town and other, um, other kids my age. Um, this was my first time doing a lot extensive heavy workouts too. Um, so it was a great way to stay fit. And um, as you can see, there's a, there's a pool in the background and after school in the spring months when the, it was nice out, I would go to the pool almost every day after school just to sit out in the sun and swim. And sometimes my younger host brother would join me. So this is my second host family. I couldn't find any pictures of my first host family, um, but I'll, I'll speak about them for a little bit. Um, my first host family was, um, my host dad was the prefect of Cremona, and that's kind of like being a governor. Um, and so my first four months, actually, I lived in uh, the government palace. And that is, that's a palace that's on the main street. And um, it was my first exposure to, uh, to, the, to a grand building. Um, it was very ornate, very exquisite. Think of Versailles, but not that fancy, but it was still, um, the insides was like, like Versailles, almost very ornate, very 
um, neoclassical style inside. Um, I was with that family for four months. And then my second host family here, uh, Nuri, she is in the colorful shirt. She's actually from Spain. And then my host dad, Giancarlo, he's from Italy. And then that is my host sister, Claudia. And not pictured in this is my younger host sister, Julia. Um, Julia is a ballerina. She's currently um, uh, doing ballet in Dresden, Germany. And when I was in Italy as an exchange student, she was at La Scala in Milan studying ballet. And during, De in December, I went to Milan with my second host family and we saw the Nutcracker and she and Julia, she was uh, performing in that, in that ballet. So now whenever I hear the Nutcracker, I always remember that moment. And then Claudia, she is currently getting her PhD in, I believe it's economics. And she's at um, Bocconi University in Milan. And both of my host family, uh, both my host parents, uh, Nuri and Giancarlo are lawyers in town. This is my third host family, the Pudati family. Um, some of you may recognize um, the boy in the dark blue shirt in the center, that's Paolo. When I was in Cremona, Paolo came to Minnesota. So we did a swap and he stayed in Apple Valley. And before I went to Italy, he told some of his friends that I was going to be there. And so on that first night I met up with my friends, um, those were some of Paolo's friends. So it was super nice to have that immediate connection with, um, with, some, uh, with, with people out there. And my older brother, my host brother, Matteo, he's on the right. He uh, is currently working for Pirelli Tires and he lives in Parma. Um, my other host brother, Alessandro in the white polo shirt, he was an exchange student last year to New York. And when I was in Italy, he was only 10 years old. And in this photo now he's, he's much older. But my host mom, Elisabetta in the pink jacket, she, um, she owned a store in, in Cremona. And this was, is a store that's been in her family for many years. Her father owned it. And it's a, like a large, I wouldn't call it a warehouse, but they sell office supplies and decorations for the home. And then my host dad, Francesco, in the tan jacket, he, uh, he works for Unilever. They were such a lovely host family. Um, when, my, when I went to, uh, let's see, I think it was October or November timeframe, I first had dinner with them. I had dinner with them for the first time because Paolo had told them I was there. And so they invited me over and I still have it. They gave me a little Ferrari keychain. Um, and Alessandro, I remember he, he loved playing the Wii. And so we would play Wii um, very frequently. And um, when we went back in 2018, Alessandro got his license to uh, ride a Vespa, drive a Vespa. So I rode on the Vespa with him. And then the picture in the lower right, that's a picture of Alessandro and me from when I was an exchange student. And so we kind of took that little time-lapse photo here in this one. Uh, these are some of my friends. Um, and let's see, the picture on the left, that was at a birthday party. Um, and birthday parties in Italy, when you turn 18, that's kind of a, that's a big deal. And so a lot of, a lot of people go all out for these birthday parties. So you have very extravagant um, dishes and um, people get dressed up for it. And it's a, it's a very fun time. And then the picture on the right are some of my, are three of my friends from the rowing team. Um, we went out 
we got to go out um, frequently. Um, that was, and I mean, honestly, it, it was like having built-in friendships, which was super great. And then these are the exchange students. This is um, from our Italy tour we took. Um, Italy did not have a, have a Euro tour. We just did a tour of all of Italy, which was still fantastic. Um, we went to Milan, Rome, Venice, Florence, all the way down to Naples. And, we, and these are all exchange students who were living in Italy. And in my town of Cremona, there were eight of us. There were eight exchange students. Um, and one thing that I tried to do um, during my year was to hang out more with the locals and learn the language. And, I'm, and I really did get to learn the language very well um, because I had that opportunity to be with locals and not always with the exchange students. Um, some Rotary events that uh, we did are, were to Venice during Carnival. Um, that was a very uh, neat experience. If any of you ever get a chance to go experience Carnival, go to Venice. Everyone, as you can see, is dressed up to the nines in this, masks, different themes, every, and everyone from tourists to Italians, everyone's in a mask. So, so the entire city is one, is all masked up. And then I got to present at some Rotary Club dinners on the lower left, the exchange student in the red jacket. Um, her name is Amanda, she's from Canada. And then this was a Rotary Club uh, near Cremona. And then we were also featured in our town's newspaper. So Studenti Stranieri Ospiti del Rotary, um, foreign exchange students of Rotary. So that was our claim to fame in the town. And that was the first, that's, that picture is from the first time that we all met with each other. And we got to go on different Rotary trips. Um, some were to uh, French Accorta, which is where they make wine. So we got to see that. Um, another one was to Venice during Carnival. And then also it was very typical to travel with your classmates. I know that a lot of the exchange students got the opportunity to travel um, to other parts of Italy. I got to travel to a few cities in Italy and then I got to go to Berlin with a class and then went to London and Bath with another class. And on that trip to London, that was more like an exchange for the Italian students so that they could learn English. And so when I went, I got to stay with an English host family. <laughs> so I was hosted in another country. It was, it was a very nice experience. Um, that's all I have. Um, are there any questions? Thanks so much, Sam. That was really, really awesome. Yeah. And take yourself off of mute and give Sam a nice round of applause. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Sammy. And uh, how about some questions? I see your dad there. Hey, Mark. <laughs> he was there, now gone. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are on mute. I have a question. Or, yeah. Sure. Eleanor, go ahead. Um, about the language. I don't know this, Sam. Did you learn Italian or was there any um, more regional dialect that was spoken in Cremona that you were aware of? Yes. Um, before I went to Italy, I had studied Spanish in high school. And then I took, um, I got some CDs from the library and I just learned, um, listened to Italian that way to familiarize myself with how to say just a few simple phrases. And my host mom, the first, the first night I got there, she thought I spoke very well. <laughs> but but um, it was very, um, it's very typical for different regions in Italy to have a different dialect. Like in the north of Italy, it's if 
someone were to speak in a Cremonese dialect, it would not sound like Italian at all. And in fact, all regions Mona? have a different dialect. And so um, the Italian language was actually developed. I read this, it, I think it was the Florentine dialect. Yeah. Italian today comes from the Florentine dialect. But some people still speak um, the dialect of their region, the older generation more so than the younger. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe this is my daughter, Amy. She was also an exchange student to Italy. Up hey, near I, I remember your presentation. Hi, Sam. I know I'm sorry I can't stick around. I got to go to work. But um, yeah, no, my dad just asked me if I knew about Cremona. But I remember us talking on my presentation about us. I went there for just the weekend. They had the Nougat Festival. And yes. So, oh, yeah. Sam talked about the Nougat Festival. Yes. <laughs> yes. We ate a lot of Nougat that weekend. <laughs> um. But yeah, no, it's great to see everybody. I just wanted to pop in and listen to what you were saying about dialects. Yeah, definitely different. I feel like maybe you experienced the same thing. I felt like fortunate, you know, give and takes for pros and cons of being in Northern versus Southern Italy. Yes. And I felt like a huge pro was that the, the Italian that I learned and that I'm sure you would have learned near Cremona was like standard Italian as yes. far as it goes. So yes, yes. That was nice. Yep. I remember one of the exchange students actually to Minnesota a couple years after I came back, I was speaking in Italian and she, and she said, oh, you have an accent from the North. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Well, the, I feel like the, of the North, did you have any friends from um, Bergamo? Cause they yes. had yeah. the funniest accents to me. They were like, Oh, they all sort of had the like, oh, you son of a, but I had a friend named Abraham and he would always introduce himself at our conferences like that. You son of a, be son of a, I was like, <laughs> it was hilarious. And they all sounded like that. Oh, oh that is great. All right. I have to go. Good to see you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Yes. Amy crashed in the party. Other questions, Chris Ann. So Sam, is there like a vibe? Can you like, is there a vibe like Northern Italy, Southern Italy? I, what, what are the, mm -hmm. what do, how do people, how would people describe themselves from the different parts of the country? Mm -hmm. I would say it's, it's actually really interesting because the North and South view each other totally differently. The North views the South as more laid, definitely more laid back, easy going. Whereas uh, people in the South would view the North as more kind of a little more in line, have a little more structure, I'd say. Um, but I mean, the vibe of Cremona itself, it was very, very easygoing, very easygoing town, nothing over the top, not, not bustling like Milan, but not super quiet, like a, like a, like a very rural town. Mm -hmm. um, it had a very nice, happy medium to it. Um, Almost kind of like a Minneapolis vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Say, mm -hmm. Greg. Um, Sam, a great presentation. So, so, you know, I kind of wish I could have gone everywhere as an exchange student. I think many of us do. I would have gone to Italy. I would have gone to Mexico. I would have gone to Brazil. I would have gone to Czech Republic. I would have gone everywhere. Um, I noticed that you had your navy blue rotary blazer and the girl from Canada had a red one. Yeah. Did, where were the ex other exchange students from? And could you tell where they were from just by the blazer? Uh, the, most of the exchange students from Canada had red. Mm -hmm. There was one girl from Germany. She, and I believe hers was like a deep green color. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest, they were, they were from the US. So they all had navy blue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, but actually, I think some, there were some students from, I think they were in Milan. No, they were us. Yeah, they were from Australia. They also had red. They also had red blazers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Oh, did Naomi, you... go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, sorry. D did you um, have uh, experience any culture shocks coming to Italy 
And then reverse culture shocks. We've discussed that with our club several times, I remember. Did you experience one and the other? And if so, how did that go? Yeah, um, I would say, yes, definitely some culture shock there. Um, the one thing that just comes to mind right now is I, I think it's very common in the US to wear flip-flops even outside in public. Mm -hmm. I remember wearing flip-flops for the first time out in Italy and everyone was like, what are you wearing? <laughs> it's just like, no, you don't wear that. <laughs> um, I, I also, my host family, um, it's, very, it's very common in uh, Italy for some families to be um, from a nobility. And there were some families in the town that, um, that knew each other um, because they were of the nobility class and the way, um, the way you eat, the way you, you know, function in a social setting, um, like who you speak to and how you, you know, how you greet them. That was definitely a, a, an, an eye opener. Um, like for eating, for example, you would eat with one hand like in a fist on the table and then in the other hand you'd have your fork with you not like a tight fist but just like have your hand on the table hmm. um so learning that was that was an eye opener um i think some the culture shock here was when when i came back to the us i think it was more so trying to see how I could readjust into my normal life here, but I don't think I have because I think I'm still, um, I, I'm just so much more, I, I'm really thankful I have this global mindset and um, uh, recognizing that, you know, everyone has the same goals and values in life, no matter what part of the world you live in. And so, um, I think I had more culture shock going there than, than coming here. Mm, thank you. You're welcome. Naomi, yeah. I saw you had your hand up. Totally. So you, it, the way you talk about some of your host family members, it sounds like you keep in touch with them to a degree. Mm -hmm. Curious uh, if you have like plans to see them slash if there's any friends that you keep in touch with too. I mean, COVID-19, you know, that <laughs> thing, but... <laughs> <laughs> I've kept in touch uh, mostly with my second and third host families and we keep in touch through WhatsApp. We actually got to FaceTime with my third host family on Christmas. And we try to do that every year, especially around Christmas, New Year's time frame. Um, but I'd say I'm, I'm definitely more in touch with my host brothers from my third host family. I think just through the way social media is nowadays or like through Instagram or like Facebook or WhatsApp. It's so easy to connect with, um, with people abroad. And I don't have any plans yet to go back, but I would really like to go back once, once things are, are more open. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, thanks. When you, Sam, went back with your parents, how long had it been after your exchange that very next year or had it been a few years? Mm -hmm. So I had, I've actually been back twice now since my exchange year. The first time I went back was in 2016. And then I went back with my parents in 2018. And when I went in 2016, there were some exchange students who were from, from Italy who were in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, they, um, I, they hosted me at their places. So I got to stay with um, one of the exchange students up near Lake Como. And mm -hmm. then I got to stay with another exchange student down near Naples. And um, both were, I mean, both their families, super hospitable and just lovely, lovely people. Um, and one of them, he is actually living in New York now. He got his master's wow. at Berkeley. And so all of the exchange students who I've known um, to Minnesota, they've all done, they've all kept up their English in some way, um, okay. some way or another. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Mm -hmm. Mark. Yes, Mark. And Sam, what are you doing now? Since I, I, I don't know that part of you. <laughs> right now, um, I, I work at Boston Scientific as an R&D engineer. 
Cool. Yes. For you. Thank you. Chris Ann. <laughs> So Italy is known for its fashion. Did yes. you, how did that come across to you? I mean, did people wear ripped jeans, never ripped jeans, you know, how did that come across? Um, ripped jeans really weren't a thing over there. Um, I would say uh, definitely more tailored, a more tailored fit. Um, I think by the end of my exchange year, I had just sort of, fizzled out every other piece of American clothing that I brought over. <laughs> um, and uh, I would say, uh, let's see, some of the brands that were very popular when I was there was like Abercrombie and Fitch. Those were popular names. A lot of, um, a lot of stores that you see here in the US. Um, also, I'd say some of the high-end stores like Gucci was very a popular brand. Um, Dolce & Gabbana, um, those two were pretty popular um, in my town. But um, yeah, definitely the fashion sense was like more, more tailored, dark clothing. When you made the comment about the flip-flops, I'm yeah. guess is like that's- That was no. Yeah. They were like, are you going to the beach? Are you like, <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> mm. It's a cute memory. It is a cute one. And yeah. I would walk. Um, so my first host family, they had a dog. And so every day I'd walk the dog after school. And so that's also how I really got to know my town. Mm -hmm. Well, just walking around, we'd walk a couple miles a day, probably. With the dog. With the dog. Wow, that's great. With the dog. And I also had a bike. In the town, it was very common to bike and very difficult to bike around, uh, walk to places as well. Um, it was a, it's a very walkable city. You could walk, I think you can walk from one end to the other in about 20, 25 minutes. Ooh. Yeah. So you're, so Italy didn't do the Euro tour when you were there, where you were able to visit any other countries nearby during your year? I was, and with, um, it was mostly with our with my classmates. So their um, field trips were either associated with some, with like a history class or a history lesson or an English class, or if they were at a, in a French class, they would go to France. Um, but for my class, we went to London and Bath um, for their, and they, the students went to an English, they went to an English school to learn, um, to do some literature work and then I also got to travel to Berlin with another class. And that was more so to learn about history on that um, German, German history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what a opportunity, study history in Berlin and English mm -hmm. and London, you know, it's really that, cool. Their, their version of a field trip was going to- uh, <laughs> Going to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> another country, yeah. That's great. A couple questions, or I had a question about um, uh, going to school six days a week. Just mm -hmm. how that, and then I also just remembered the the trip in the RV. Oh yeah, um, so school six days a week for five hours a day. That was definitely an adjustment because um, I'm. I mean, we're so used to having Fridays be our Friday, mm -hmm. and. Um, I remember being very, very tired in the first couple of weeks, just like learning the language and trying to absorb everything. Um, so I would most often take a nap after lunch every day. Mm -hmm. um, and then to the uh, RV point, um, one of my um, friends, uh, he was also an exchange student, and his host family, um, they, uh, they had an RV and we drove to Paris one, one weekend for Christmas around Christmas time frame. So that was, the, that was another spot that I got to go. And to. did you, did you stop along the way? I mean, in the, you had the RV, so were you stopping throughout, um, you know, Italy and France or? Not stuff? really, not mm -hmm. really. I remember, I think we made one pit stop in the mountains somewhere. But that was it. 
very cool. Yes, Sandy. Do you have any special memories about the food, things that the surprised you or anything that stuck with you? My first host mom, she was a very good cook. And a couple on a couple occasions, she would make dishes I would never try here. One was um, sardines with pasta. And then the other was lamb, lamb kidneys, which those actually turned out to be pretty good. Also horse. Um, she made horse one time, horse and rabbit. Um, not really my preferred <laughs> choice, mm -hmm. but um, still delicious. And one thing that, um, one dish that my third host mom cooked was tortellini in broth. And that is a lovely dish, especially in the winter. It's like a chicken broth and then tortellini in there floating. Mm -hmm. And the bread was always fresh um, from the market. And that was, that was one thing that's nice about Italy is the food is so fresh. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, one dish that my host mom brought home one time. It was raw meat, but it was soup. It was like very, very raw meat that you could still eat it. Mm -hmm. It was still, it was cured enough that it was safe to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did you learn how to cook any of these things? Uh, not exactly, <laughs> not exactly, but, um, I did try to make a tiramisu one time and that, that turned out pretty good. All right. Mm -hmm. Damn, it's dad in the back room. <laughs> hey, I, I, I just want to say that, uh, having not been an exchange student, uh, I've lived a remarkable life through my family mm. and, um, our children came back with such a huge view of, of what was possible. And <clears throat> meeting uh, the host families in Brazil for Sofia and in Italy, just remarkable for me. I was content to be, to not understand the language. It was enough for me to tag along and hear our children and my wife uh, speak the language that they learned over the, over the year. And I'm just so impressed with um, the maturity and the grace that our children developed on their exchange, but then also to meet these other fabulous people, the, the host families and then their friends. Um, I, I just like hopping on the train and hope I can hang on. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, Sam, for um, bringing me along and, um, and sharing this wonderful trip down memory lane uh, with you. And then I'm remembering Sophia's trip too. So, and thank you all for, uh, you know, this, I, I listen in to your conversations and I'm just glad that this group has started to focus on exchange because uh, it's fun to listen to my wife and my children talk about it, and and uh, and my sister-in-laws and 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 my niece. So, um, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. And oh, Olga. Olga. if there is time for a, a, a one more question, I would love to ask Please. you, Sam. Um, it, and first of all, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to extend the thanks in, in a different way, but uh, this is so exciting. I had a, a host son from Italy too, where they have that funny accent that Amy talked about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, where are you from? We're in Italy. From Bologna. Oh, and, Bologna, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the mountains. Uh, and, um, and then I uh, uh, counseled uh, a girl from Sardinia. Well, but uh, and I'm from from Northern Europe, which uh, we have a lot of things in common. If you talk about the nobility, if you go north, people are more structured. You go south, the Belgians are wild. Let me <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my question is, uh, um, my 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 second question um, to you: Did you learn anything about yourself during this experience, and has it impacted your the rest of your life or? your career or anything like that? I would say one thing too would be the phrase that comes to mind that I remember people saying is con calma, which means like 
with calm. So meaning don't rush. It's fine. It'll get done. You'll be fine. <laughs> so I think incorporating that into, especially now during, you know, with the pandemic happening, I think con calma just comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, so incorporating that aspect um, into my life has been, uh, has been really reward, very nice. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Mark and Patricia, we uh, in in the club we usually um, end the um, end the meeting with four way test instead of starting. So if everyone can take themselves off of mute and the rotary four way test of the things we think, say, and do, is it is the, the truth? truth? Is it, is it, is it fair, fair to all, all concerns? Concern? Will it, will it build will it goodwill, goodwill and better, better, friendships? better friendships? Will it, will it, be, will beneficial it be beneficial to all concerned? concerned? We like, I like, I don't know if everyone else likes, I like doing that at the end of the meeting because I feel like we go back into the rest of our lives with those four important principles really at the, you know, in our mind as we say goodbye to everyone. And so, um, yeah, and for Mark and Patricia, just to let you know a little bit about the E-Club is that um, we do accept members, not just throughout the 5960 district. I happen to be in Minnetonka, so I'm, although president of the club, live physically um, out of the district, as do a number of people, a number of our members. So, and our dues are $270 a year. And then we also have a friend of the E-Club for other formal members of other um, Rotary Clubs for $100 a year. So you can be a friend and kind of show up and be a part of our group, even if you're a formal member elsewhere. But we've really tried to keep, you know, this is this is a new model, I think, for both us and um, 5960 District and Rotary in general. Um, you know, do these E-Clubs with a particular focus have a place for Rotary in the future? I, I, I think they do. So, you know, the question is how, how, um, how will they be the same as a regular in-person club and how will they be different? Of course, during COVID, we're kind of all in this model anyway, but I, I think, um, you know, it's things like service. We've, we've discussed it's easy to do a service project when you're all in one community and all live a mile away from each other. When someone's in Denver and someone in Marshall, Minnesota, like Benton, and some in Wisconsin, and some in the Twin Cities, and when you're all over the place, you know, what does service mean? I think that's in our second year of kind of being an organized club, we're taking a look at that and whatnot. So, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it's new and different. And, you know, we welcome you guys back anytime. Please do, uh, please do join. If, and if uh, there's anyone you know in your lives that is passionate about youth exchange that is either not involved with Rotary or you know the current structure just isn't currently working, have them have them stop on by. It's always the same uh, same link, and and uh, we welcome guests. So, well, it's a great opportunity, especially for people who have been youth exchange students. In fact, I was just thinking of some people in Rochester. Mm. I love their experience, and so this would be a perfect uh, club for them to join. So I shall share it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation, Sam. Oh, uh, you're it welcome. Makes me want to go back to Italy again. Yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> and Chris Ann, sorry for putting you on the spot again here, but um, do you have next week's? Um... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every week to look at our spreadsheet and see who the upcoming speaker is, so. Okay, Paul Perez is gonna speak next week. So that's our past um, district governor and he's gonna speak about the Rotary Foundation. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah and he, uh, he joined last week for those not present and we um, in the past year were the number one small club in terms of foundation giving, so he um, recognized us for that, and that was uh, that was exciting for us. So that is really great. Yeah. Very good. Well, hey everybody, have a great week. Any final parting thoughts? Just great to see Eleanor. It's got to be late for you. Don't you have school tomorrow? Um, no, actually. Well, now's time as ever. I'm actually back in Minnesota. Um, I was I was teaching in Spain. Um, I. Oh I my gosh. In 
since until last week. I, I got back a week ago today. Um, oh. Yeah, I was in southern Spain hanging out with some some babies in an elementary school. Wow. But small town life in a pandemic is a lot harder yeah. than exchange. Yeah. Um, not in a pandemic. So I ended up coming home early. But. Yeah. Well, Good welcome job. back. Sorry that that was uh, cut short. That's I know. Awesome. I know it's a <laughs> pandemic and it impacts all of us, right? So, yes, exactly. Yeah, but you seem happy, and uh, I'm sure your parents are thrilled to have you back. They really are. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ellen, Eleanor, quickly for you. Are you yes. ready? <gasps> oh my gosh! Ooh. Oh, there it is. Bridge. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> so cute. A, a little bit, uh, and there's a little Italy. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, but I, I, I thought you'd I thought you'd enjoy a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of the check in the background. Oh yeah, some orange roofs. That's all I need. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Mark, watch out. Otherwise, we might uh, hit you up to be the next speaker on your travel. I I'd, I'd be glad to. Uh, anytime you want, we can go anywhere in the world if you like. There we go. We could hit uh, we could hit a little. Uh, that goes back to Italy. Sandy would love to talk about Italy sometime. That's a whole nother story. But I've actually been to 32 different countries. Oh my gosh. So, oh. so uh, I'd, I'd love to speak anytime if you want, if you're how in many, need uh, of a speaker. Of, yeah, out of curiosity, how many have been with Rotary or a Rotary tie-in? Uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, Belgium, Australia, England. Hmm check mm -hmm. uh maybe eight with wow. rotary oh, that's great the rest were uh privately done yeah for sure yeah. well so, hey so great to have you here hey, thanks sam just come on back anytime <laughs> good really job thank you. Okay. thank you have a great